Good morning. I bring you greetings from St. Stephen's Church of God in Christ. I am missionary Tennessee Ortiz, and I personally want to thank you for joining our Sunday School lesson live stream this morning. I want to also give honor to my pastor, Bishop Thomas, Executive Pastor Elder Hughes, and I want to give a special shout out to our Sunday School Superintendent, Missionary Jacqueline Williams. Um, if you would like to give to this ministry or sow into this ministry, know that you can do so via Givelify at St. Stephen's Cogic, C-O-G-I-C. We want to let you know that we thank you in advance for any contribution that you desire to give. And we also want you to know that the Lord will truly bless you for your generosity. Let us pray. Father God, we just want to say thank you. God, we thank you. We just thank you, Lord. We thank you for the rest last night. We thank you for waking us up this morning. We thank you for the activities of our limbs, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your protection, for your peace, God. We thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, just want to send a special prayer, God, for those that are dealing with mental illness, God. Oh, God, you know the need. Lord, let them feel your comfort and your presence and your love. In Jesus' name, God, touch them in a special way, God, in the name of Jesus. Look on our leadership, Lord, spiritual and natural, God. Oh, God, continue to give them the wisdom to guide us, God, in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, that you will be glorified, God, because you are in control. Lord, we thank you and we ask all things in your son's precious name, in Jesus' name, amen. Look, it is Sunday school, like I said. And I'm excited as usual. Uh, our lesson today is lesson nine. If you have your uh, Church of God in Christ Sunday School curriculum, you should already have your books out. If not, you know that you can follow along with your Bible apps and your Bibles. We will be using the King James translation in our scripture reading today. The topic is the Lord loves justice. Amen. We will proceed in developing the lesson as it is printed in your books in the following manner, the Bible basis, Bible truth, memory verse. Also, we'll touch on life need for today's lesson, Bible learning, Bible application, and the students' responses. We will also read all of the scriptures or the verses in the lesson today, and that's a total of seven. So let's dive in. Amen. The Bible basis is coming from Isaiah chapter 61 verses 8 through 11, and then it skips to chapter 62, verses 2 through 4. And the first thing I want to talk about before we continue with uh, the, the layout is that Isaiah is uh, one of the five books uh, written by the major prophets, major meaning that the books were longer. You know, they're minor and major prophets in the Bible. So these books uh, from the major prophets were the fact that they were longer in the uh, uh, Scriptures. And then also Isaiah is known for his prophecies on the Messiah, uh, the fact that he came to, God, to save mankind from their sins. The Bible truth for today's lesson, the Lord promises, he promises to place his love and justice on the people of Israel. The memory verse, for I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offerings, and I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Isaiah 61 and 8. Like me for today's lesson, it says, when people feel helpless and angry, they seek help from others. We all do that. We go to the person that we know we can confide in. We go to the person that we know can keep our business, that we can trust. Amen. So we seek out that person. It says, what hope is there that the conditions of the powerless will be addressed? Those that are marginalized, those that, you know, need help or being mistreated. What is that hope? Well, Isaiah, this lesson today, affirms that the righteous will be vindicated. Amen. Bible learning. God places his love on his people. Oh, God's love is not like man. It's agape love. It's pure. Amen. Bible application, Christians revel, meaning we delight in the reception of God's love and promises of justice. We look forward to that. Our hope is in that. And the students' responses, believers commit themselves to serving the Lord and acting justly. Let us read the scriptures, beginning again at uh, chapter 61, verse 8. 
For I, the Lord, love justice, or judgment, meaning justice. That's even either you deserve punishment or you deserve a reward. That's God justice because it's fair. I hate robbery for burnt offerings, and I will direct work in truth, their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. All that seem the see them shall acknowledge them, they that are the seed which the Lord have blessed. Verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he have clothed me with the garments of salvation. He have, clothed, he have covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom, which is, which is, a, which is a, a groom, uh, decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. Verse 11, for as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. We're skipping to verse, well, excuse me, chapter 62, verses 2 through 4. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem, which is a crown, in the hand of thy God. Last verse. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate. But thou shalt be called Hephzibah, which is the city of God's delight, and thy land Beulah, which is the bride of God. For the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. We thank God for his word. Amen. So I want to give you a little background on this particular passage that we're studying. I'm going to read from your books, The Source of Comfort. Um, that's on my, in my book, it's on page 350, but it's under the title introduction in your lesson. And it says, a source of comfort. The prophet Isaiah articulates a message about justice from an unlikely place. See, the children of Israel were in captivity. They were captive uh, by Babylon. Babylon. The Babylons had uh, overtaken them, overthrown them. However, it was in God's uh, divine will that this occurred because of what? Israel's disobedience. So God had told them, in your disobedience, your enemies will overtake you. So they were in captive during this time. So in the midst of Babylon captivity, in that place, God has seemingly, think about it, seemingly, not that he has, but he's seemingly forsaken the people of Israel and has used a more corrupt nation, that's the Babylonians, to punish God's own people for their corruption. This timeless spirit and commitment to calling out injustice becomes immortalized in the words of Isaiah, and that's at the beginning of the chapter 61, verses 1 through 4. The very words that Luke records Jesus using as the text for his initial sermon in Luke 8, excuse me, Luke 4. This illustration that God's commitment to justice transcends time, space, and communities, even to people who find themselves in diaspora, meaning they're scattered abroad in foreign lands. They're not in their homeland, in which the children of Israel was in a foreign land. They were captive by Babylon. Amen. Uh, they can comfort themselves in knowing that God still loves what? Justice and that he is faithful to righting the wrongs that have been inflicted upon them, even though it was in his divine will that they would be captive of the Babylonians, captives of the Babylonians, it wasn't in God's will that they would be mistreated. Come on now. You see what I'm saying? God's ways are not like our ways. It wasn't in his will that they would receive injustice by this corrupt nation. God was not about that. He is not the author of evil. Amen. Also, the purpose of this passage, it is a love letter. You might not have thought that, but it's a love letter. And I'm going to read a little bit from the book on that. It says, verses 8 and 9 are not on the Lord's hatred. Rather, they center on the Lord's love for those who have been mistreated and suffer injustice. 
a look for those who feel that God has forgotten them. Amen. Because it seems like evil has won the day. To those people, the Lord writes this love letter about justice to them and shares how he will settle the accounts because his covenant is everlasting. And his blessings can relocate them from a place of shame to a place of what? Prominence. I think about that scripture that we are not what? The tail. We are what? The head. Yeah. We shall not be what? The bar. When we are what? The lender. Hallelujah. I know I get excited. And then I'm going to read about the meaning of the covenant because you need to understand that. And the divine covenant. This is also in your books. So a covenant is simply a legal binding agreement, a legal binding agreement. It's a contract between two parties. However, in the divine covenant, God always, always takes the initiative for the benefit of his people. Hallelujah. When God promises to make an everlasting covenant here in this text, he is indeed renewing an already existing covenant relationship with his people. This everlasting covenant is also described by another prophet, uh, Jeremiah. That's in chapter 31 of Jeremiah. It includes the blessing of the new covenant that Jesus Christ instituted by his death. Remember, Isaiah, his book is, is major prophecies about the Messiah. He talks about the Messiah, what, uh, bearing our burdens, wounded for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was what? Upon him. So this is just renewing that covenant that Jesus Christ has instituted, well, will institute in this particular passage by his death. Amen. I want to talk about verse 9 as well. It says, well, excuse me, verse 8, 61 and 8. It says, for I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offering. And I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I hate robbery for burnt offering describes God's character, who he is. He is a fair and just God. We see that in this passage. Even though they were in captivity, because of their own disobedience, God was still concerned about them. His love was still there. He had not forsaken them. This is what Isaiah was telling them. Amen. So essentially, this sentence or this verse is essentially saying, uh, for I, the Lord, love justice. Therefore, I hate blunder, meaning robbery, which is what? By force. I hate that and evil. So this is what he was saying. We don't, we don't like robbery ourselves. Amen. We don't want people to come in and take things that belong to us. Amen. So that is by what? Force. And this is what God is saying. I hate that. And this is what the Babylonians had done. Even though the Lord had allowed it to be so, the Babylonians were going to be dealt with in regards to their wrongdoing. Amen. So, you know, points that I like to glean from the lesson. We have three today. Uh, point one is that know that God cannot lie. He is what? A promise keeper. Hallelujah. Verse 8 talks about that. It says, faithfully reward them and make an everlasting covenant with them. Numbers 23 and 19 says, God is not like what? Man. He tells no lies. Amen. He changes his mind. He does not change his mind like man. Hallelujah. What he promises, he will do. That includes blessings and it includes judgment. So God is not like man. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians verses 1, well, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20, Apostle Paul picks it up. He says, God's promises are yea and amen. Hallelujah. Meaning they are sure and firm. Why? Because God is faithful and true. Hallelujah. Therefore, we have great expectation that it will be what? So then that's why we can have a yes. Yes, Lord. Why? Because you, you are faithful. Why? Because you are trustworthy. Hallelujah. So we have a yes in our spirit. A yes to his will. A yes to his way. Hallelujah. Point two. 
know who you are and to whom you belong to. We are the children of the most high God. We are God's children. Hallelujah. Isaiah was prophesying to Israel in a time of their captivity <clears throat> that God was still concerned about them. He had not forsaken them. Um, we are not forsaken. We are not desolate, meaning we are not deprived of his love. <clears throat> Excuse me. There is power in his name. And we have power because of our faith in him, which builds our relationship with him. <coughs> Excuse me. Second Corinthians 5, 17 and 18 says, we are new creatures in him. Therefore, all old things are passed away. Our relationship is restored in him when we accept Jesus Christ as our personal savior. Let me read something here. <coughs> It says, we are called Christians, our, since we are called Christians, our name should motivate us to look and be more like Jesus. Paul told us in Corinthians, we are new creatures. Therefore, we are not what we were born into. We were born in what? Sin, shaped in what? Iniquity, in our mother's womb. That's scripture. But when we accept Jesus Christ, we are what? New, new creatures. Amen. So therefore, we should look like Jesus. We should act like Jesus. We should think like Jesus. If the name of Jesus is tarnished by us, then we have done a disservice to the gospel. Hallelujah. Think about that. So look, we are restored by our relationship. Therefore, we know who we are. And no matter what situation, the children of Israel were in captivity, but they were still God's children. Hallelujah. They were, you know, being, you know, uh, had injustice coming upon them by their captors, but they were still what God's children. God's love was still uh, for them. In today's time, we think about that. We are dealing with circumstances because of what? A fallen world. Amen. But we are still God's what? Children. We still have his love. He has not forsaken us. Point three, we are dressed in divine attire by God. I want you to get this. This is verse 10 and 11. <clears throat> Let me read it. It says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with garment of salvation. For Israel, the salvation was deliverance from captivity and righteousness. Amen. We can't be right apart from God. I don't care how we try. So we need his righteousness, his, his purity, Yay. amen, his justice, amen. So look, for Christians today, you and I, it's God's forgiveness through what? His son, Jesus Christ, and his righteousness. Let me read this, amen. It says, God promises to adorn his people in this particular passage, the children of Israel, with the promise of rescue. <coughs> Excuse me. His righteousness and his blessings. As Christians, for us today, we know that God will protect us from harm and bless us <coughs> in order to share his love and justice with those we know. We are clothed in the forgiveness and righteousness of Jesus Christ, who has cleansed us from sin, from the inside out, and given us a new heart to love God and others. Our clothes are to be outward and inward. Amen. No, excuse me. Amen. So not only does he do a change inward, but he does a change outward. Amen. People can act all day and pretend. I like to call them pretenders. Amen. But what's on the inside? is going to come out on the outside. So God is a God of complete work. Hallelujah. He doesn't have to do anything. So he does a work on the inside that manifests itself on the outside. Amen. So we got to understand that. And in this, uh, in the dress and divine attire by God, I'm not just talking about your clothes. People like to gripe on that a lot. 
Hallelujah. But you can't change somebody. Only God can. So again, that inside work is what flows on the outside, not just with our clothing, hallelujah, but with our actions, amen, with the way we treat one another, amen, with the justice that Jesus loves. We cannot do that apart from him. So in our response, what, what should we do in our response? We read that in the beginning. It says believers commit themselves to serving the Lord and acting justly. So our response should be to rest in his word, which is where we find his blessings. That's the importance of God's word. We find what we need to do, how we need to be doing it, and we rest in it. Why? Because his word is what gives us life. His word is what keeps us. Amen. And we commit to serving God and offer what we have received from him in our own lives. That's love his mercy, his justice, and his salvation, hallelujah, to others regardless of their race, gender, nationality, or their age. People are being mistreated because of a lot of things. It's not just race. People are being mistreated because they don't think like others. People are being mistreated because they're older. We think about the pandemic that we're going through. When it first started, people were just thinking this is only about the old until them young folks started getting sick. God does not have a respect of person. So therefore we need to understand that with justice, amen. Just like we're understanding it now with the pandemic. There is no respect of person. We all die, we all get sick at some point in our lives, amen. God's justice is for all, hallelujah. So when we do this, then is our Father, God in heaven, glorified. And all the world will know we are his beloved children. This is what God was saying through the prophet Isaiah to the children of Israel. Look, you have to be judged or you have to pay the consequences of your sin. That consequences for the children of Israel was what? Captivity. However, God in his just awesomeness and his love for us did not leave them there. You think about that. He, he, he did not leave them there. Think about us. God did not leave us in our sinful state. We talked about this on Resurrection Sunday. He did what? He sent his son, his only begotten son, that he would what? Die, amen, and bear our sins. Hallelujah. Therefore, in bearing our sins, what he did was he gave us hope. He didn't leave us in that position. Hallelujah. So we thank God for that, and we honor him for that. And the children of Israel, they were not left in their captivity. This is what Isaiah was saying, that I'm going to make you, you know, uh, I'm going to prove you out among the nations, um, among the heathen nations. That, that term Gentiles is non-Jew, anyone not believing in God. Amen. And you may say, Sister Teacher, what does this mean to us? Because this is really Old Testament, and this is talking about but what it means to us is that he has sent his son, like I said, to die for us, to make us new creatures. And therefore, in him, we can be a blessing to the nations. We can glorify God to the nations. Hallelujah. We can let them know that what God has done for us he can do for you. And then all of the nation, like I said, all of the nations will know that we are his beloved children and God will be glorified. So there is a prayer that is printed, amen, in your uh, lesson books. I hope that you have gotten uh, something from the word today. I know you have. You, you know now that the Lord loves justice. And not only that, you know that he loves you, amen. Let us read this prayer. Uh, as we end, Father, we thank you for placing your love and justice upon us. Thank you for clothing us in your righteousness, goodness, and love. We pray that we will be able to share your love with others throughout this world and that you will use us to accomplish your desires. Hallelujah. We pray that we will be a people known for our love, justice, compassion, and mercy. We forgive, uh, please forgive us for the ways that we fail to conduct ourselves justly. 
Restore us in righteousness and guide us in your truth. In Jesus' name, amen.